Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, yeah, we are able to see your screen. Okay, so uh, let me introduce you. Although I think everybody in the audience already know you. Uh, so today's talk on disorder induced optical transitions in uh, 2D materials. Uh, it will begin by Nihit Sagar. He was a 2009 batch uh, TIFR integrated PhD student. And currently he's working at the uh, University of Münster as a postdoc. So uh, Nihit, uh, we can okay. start. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction and thank you to the organizer for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, it's nice to meet uh, people from TIFR again. Okay, so today I will discuss some disorder-induced optical processes or optical transitions in two-dimensional materials. And uh, uh, so I'll start with a brief introduction to 2D materials. I think the speakers who have spoken in the seminar series before me have introduced 2D materials quite well. So I will keep the introduction very brief. And I will also focus mainly on the optical properties of 2D materials, which is uh, my core research area. Then I will discuss some of the typical defects or disorder related processes in 2D materials, in particular, uh, focusing on structural defects and dopants. Then I will uh, discuss how can we use optical spectroscopy as a tool to characterize these defects and disorder. Taking two examples, one example would be of Raman spectroscopy of graphene, and the other example would be PLS or photoluminescence spectroscopy of uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, taking example of MOS2. And finally, I will uh, very briefly uh, discuss uh, some of my own work where I have uh, studied these disorder induced optical transitions in a combined Raman and PL spectroscopy study in monolayer MOS2. So as we all know about, uh, most of us know about two dimensional materials. So when we uh, see these 2D materials in the lab, they typically come in the form of these shiny crystals. And then we take one of these crystals and we use this scotch tape technique to exfoliate it into individual uh, layers or multiple layers. And the atomic structure of these 2D materials is like this, uh, where they have very strong covalent bonding in plane in a typical layer, uh, while the bonding between the layers is typically of van der Waals nature and is weak. Uh, and so it's easy to exfoliate these layers from the bulk crystal using this scotch tape. And then you can uh, transfer these uh, single layers or multiple layers onto different substrates of your choice, uh, deterministically or non-deterministically as you wish to do. Another important property of these materials is that uh, they have no dangling bonds. So you, the single layers that are obtained from these materials are uh, mostly stable at room temperature. And uh, many of these two-dimensional materials have a semiconducting, semiconducting nature. So they have an optical band gap, unlike graphene. Now, one interesting aspect of these materials is that they can exist in different kinds of polytypes, as I show over here. So depending on the stacking order, for example, they can be of uh, a bulk, can be of 2H polytype or 3R polytype. And they can also uh, undergo structural phase transitions and in which the, the structure is changed and they can become uh, like a 1T polytype where the electronic properties are also changed and uh, it becomes from a semiconducting to a metallic crystal. So now coming to the optical prop interesting optical properties of these materials. Uh, so. Uh, this is a famous plot uh, where you see that as we reduce the thickness of a typical uh, MOS2 bulk material from a bulk to a monolayer, uh, 
the band gap the band structure of this material changes especially around the gamma point uh, of the bellua zone where you see that in the bulk form uh, it was an indirect band gap and as you decrease the thickness uh, the band structure around gamma point changes uh, the valence band decreases in energy and in the monolayer limit it becomes a direct band gap material now because of their two dimensional nature and also reduced screening effect in two dimensions uh, the excitons or electron hole pairs that exist in these materials have large binding energy that means they have very strong coulomb interaction uh, and because of uh, this nature not only a single electron and hole but also two electrons and one hole or one electron and two hole can also be bound together in these materials and their signatures can be seen in a typical uh, photoluminescence spectrum at low temperatures another very interesting property of these materials is that because of the broken inversion symmetry in a single layer form and a combination of time reversal symmetry uh, they have a unique band structure around the k point of uh, the so, excuse me yeah yeah sorry for the interruption can you explain the trion and the origin origin of the trion once again uh, i missed it yeah so uh, when you optically excite or excite them in any other way the electron and hole pair in the lattice can come together due to because they are oppositely charged they can come together form an exciton right but it can also happen then that oh, yeah that's of, fine yeah so instead of one electron and one hole coming together you can also have two electron and one hole or one electron and two holes which are bound together in a three particle state and that can be the ground state of the system then and that is called a trion uh, yeah but the problem is uh, uh, the, the how that could maintain the charge neutrality of the system uh, uh, so yeah so yeah you are right so yeah that's a good question so basically the trions would mostly exist when you have some kind of intentional or unintentional doping in the material Okay, I got it. And you have additional charge carriers. Only then you will have the formation of trions. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So another interesting aspect of these materials is that because of a combination of broken inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry, they have a typical uh, band structure around the K point, where you can see that. Uh, by using a circularly polarized light you can excite one of these two alternate valleys that exist at the k and k prime points of the bellua zone selectively so for example you can use a right hand circularly polarized light and excite only the k prime valley without exciting the k valley and when the electrons and holes that are excited at the k prime valley they recombine uh, they preserve Uh, this circular polarization and so the emission that you get out of uh, this excitation would also be circularly polarized and that is typically seen uh, in experiments so with this uh, brief introduction i would now come to the uh, second part which is the discussion of defects and disorder in 3d materials that part would also be uh, very brief so yeah so this is a typical tem image of uh, different kinds of point defects in a monolayer mos2 crystal so you see that there can be different kinds of defects like a single sulfur atom missing from the lattice which is called a single sulfur vacancy uh, you can also have two sulfur atoms missing side by side and that will be a, a bi sulfur vacancy you can also have clusters of different kinds of vacancies and so on so basically these different kinds of point defects can be observed uh, in tem so they these defects are not only important uh, for uh, electronic properties of these materials but they also 
kind of introduce these uh, defect states in the band between the band gap of these materials. And so when you excite these materials optically, uh, you can also expect to see the signatures of these uh, band gap states in your optical spectrum or in your typical PL spectrum, for example. Uh, besides these points effect, point defect. I, I, one second. This TM image is real, in real space or in momentum space? These are atoms or uh, just planes? These are atoms, mostly. Okay. Okay. And yeah, because then you can see the vacancies. Uh, yeah. So besides these point defects, you can also have other kinds of uh, structural defects like grain boundaries. When you have a polycrystalline sample, you can have a boundary between uh, these two crystalline uh, space crystalline spaces. You can have rotational defects, you can have edges, for example. And so all these uh, structural defects exist in, this, in these materials and can affect their properties. Another kind of defects that I would like to discuss is dopants. Uh, so because uh, you can have different kinds of uh, adsorbate like water molecules or any uh, oxygen molecule or any other impurity molecule going and sitting on the surface of your uh, 2D material. Now this adsorbent can be physically adsorbed on the surface or it can also form bonds uh, and be chemically adsorbed. And depending on the site at which it is adsorbed and its nature, it can uh, change the electronic structure in different ways. Another uh, kind of dopant is substitutional dopant. So for example, if you replace the molybdenum atom in a bilayer MOS2 lattice with a niobium atom, uh, you can introduce a structural phase transition uh, from a 2H form to a 3R form, which is also uh, seen in these images. And so, yeah, so these dopants uh, can also donate or take up uh, electrons from the lattice. And so they can also introduce uh, different kinds of uh, new properties or change the optical properties of these materials. So with this- uh, brief... Excuse me. Uh, so so uh, I'm not very much familiar with this technical term. Uh, so can you please explain what is the 2H thing and uh, the three R yeah. uh, phases? Yes, thank you. So as I explained in the introduction, you can see when the stacking so this is the uh, typical stacking order of a 2D material, of a semiconducting 2D material like molysulfide, molyselenide, et cetera. And can you see my uh, pointer here? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, so when you have this kind of stacking order in a bulk form, then it's okay. called a 2H polytype. And when you have this different kind of uh, stacking order. So basically in the, if you look at these stackings in the uh, reciprocal space, you would see that the K and K prime values of the two layers are on top of each other in the 2H form. Mm -hmm. And in a 3R form, typically the K value will be on top of the K value of the layer beneath and the K prime would be on top of the K prime value. And that is the three R form. Okay, I got you. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, so with this uh, brief introduction to the uh, defects, I would like to now- uh, Sorry, Nihit, I have just a small question that uh, how experimentally um, uh, one has to verify that, that is that it is 2H or 3R it means my question is that how, how experimentally one can find the structural phase transition? Uh, yes, so experimentally there is, uh, so in, you can do a absorption measurement. Okay. Or you can also do a sensitive reflectivity measurement. Okay. And uh, you would see that uh, there is uh, in the 2H form, if you take a bilayer or a bulk crystal of MOS2, for example, in the 2H form, you would see some additional interlayer transitions. Okay. In your spectrum, while in the 3R form, uh, 
you would not see them. And this is one way to actually distinguish between these two. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so with that, let me come to uh, the part where I discuss how we can use optical spectroscopy as a tool to characterize disorder uh, in these materials. And first of all, I will take the example of Raman spectroscopy of graphene. So if you look at the Raman spectrum of a pristine uh, graphene layer, you would see these two phonon modes, which are prominent, these two Raman features. So one is called the G mode and the other is called the 2D mode. When you introduce defects in graphene by functionalizing it, by creating vacancies, or even uh, some other means, you would see some additional uh, features in the Raman spectrum. And these features actually arise from these resonant Raman scattering processes, which are shown over here. So for example, this D prime feature is because uh, of the scattering of an electron from uh, one part of the graphene cone to the other part, which is then scattered back with the help of a defect. And so if you don't have a defect, this process would not be active. But in the presence of the defect, this process would be activated. Similarly, you can have intervalley re resonant processes like shown over here, which is responsible for the D peak. And so you can correlate these uh, defect related peaks with the amount of uh, disorder in graphene. For example, when you are functionalizing it or when you are creating defects or just for the characterization of your pristine material to know how good its properties are. And so that can be done, for example, here. So uh, as you can see, if you functionalize graphene by treating it with a hydrogen plasma, you are basically hydrogenating it. You see that the D peak uh, is absent in the pristine case, but with the uh, with more and more oxygen, with more and more hydrogen plasma treatment, this D peak evolves, and the ratio between the D and G peak changes. Similarly, when you create vacancy by using argon ions and bombarding it. Uh, onto your graphene crystal, you again see the evolution of this D peak. And so a ratio of the intensity of the D peak uh, versus the G peak can be a measure of how many defects you are creating in your sample or are present in your graphene sample. And not only you can quantify the amount of defects, but also you can quantify what kind of defects there are. For example, the ratio of the D to the D prime peak is sensitive to the kind of defects that you have. So if you functionalize graphene, you create these sp3 hybridized bond, and you can have the ratio of the D prime D to D prime peak, which is of the order of 30. While when you have vacancy defects, the ratio would be typically of the order of seven and with a boundary or an edge you would have the ratio to be different. And so by quantifying the ratio of, of the intensities of these peaks, you can quantify what kind of defect uh, you have in your sample. So with that, let me now come uh, to- uh, Just, a, just a, a small clarification that uh, the, cl uh, the classification that you have made here, uh, I mean that, if we have a uh, say if we have a uh, defect that has a sp3 nature in the boundary then what should happen yeah then it will be complicated yes you are right so it, then it will be complicated so then you can cannot really uh, do this in a simple way like this then the slope might be you know in between sp3 and the boundary so yeah Okay, I am just, uh, I am asking that because, uh, so if that is the case, uh, uh, that uh, comes from a general intuition, that is if it will be in between sp3 and boundary, so one may get confused with the vacancy defect with it, uh, so uh, that's why. Yes, you are right, so it's not a, it's not a 
is not the best way to to do it, but it is one way to do it. So you can okay. use other means. For example, then you can have a look at the p, uh, not the pl, but maybe some. You can image your sample and look at the edges, you know, and you can do spectroscopy at the edges versus the center to quantify these things. So you can go for other things. Yeah, that that may be the uh, good way to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So with this uh, brief introduction to the Raman spectroscopy of graphene, let me come to photoluminescence spectroscopy, which is also a powerful technique that can be used to quantify defects in semiconducting uh, TMDs or transition metal dichalcogenides. So I will take an example from my own work here. So when you look at the typical low temperature photoluminescence spectrum of monolayer MOS2, you see that there is a dominant A peak, uh, which is due to the excitons or a mixture of excitons and trions in this material. But you also see this broad shoulder at lower energies, uh, which is typically labeled as D. So the origin of this uh, D peak is uh, kind of debated and there is a lot of literature that has come up over the past years uh, to understand the nature of this peak. So when we started, we saw that uh, we have a single D peak in some of the samples, but in other samples, we also have not one, but two different uh, peaks below the excitonic peaks. And when we looked at the change in the peak energy of this uh, D and A excitonic peak with as a function of temperature, uh, we saw that if we consider the D peak to be a single Gaussian or try to fit it with a single Gaussian, then it has a very different temperature. Its peak energy has a very different temperature dependence compared to the A peak. While if we resolve this peak into two different peaks, and then plot the peak energy dependence of the temperature, uh, peak energy as a function of temperature, we see that it, it follows a similar behavior as the A excitonic peak. Okay, so this was one indication that maybe this D peak has two components, D1 and D2, and they also have some kind of commonality with respect to this A excitonic peak because it fall, it's peak energy follows a similar behavior to the A excitonic peak with temperature. Next, we looked at this circular polariza polarization dependence of the PL spectrum. So basically in this experiment, we excite our sample with a laser, uh, a red laser, uh, and we excite with a circularly polarized red laser. And when we collect the emission spectrum, uh, we also resolve it for circular polarization. And so what you observe over here is that the A peak, which is coming from the free excitons, is circularly polarized, but the D1 and D2 peaks are unpolarized. And that uh, kind of indicates that these are originating from some kind of defect, because if you think about it, when you have a free exciton, it is more delocalized in the real space and has is more localized in the reciprocal space around the K valley. And so it will preserve the selection rules that are valid at these points of the Bilderberg. But when you have a defect bound feature or a defect related feature, then uh, you expect it to be localized in the real space. And so it's more delocalized in the reciprocal space. And so you would expect that maybe the selection rules, which are valid at uh, these K and K prime values, no longer hold for these features. And so you do not see a circular polarization dependence of these peaks over here. So the valley polarization uh, is not there for these bound, uh, defect bound peaks. The second, uh, thing that we did is we looked at the power dependence of these features. So we excite uh, our sample with higher and higher laser power. 
and we look at the integrated PL intensity. And you see that the A exciton peak follows a linear behavior as a function of power, but the D1 and D2 peak, they kind of saturate uh, at higher powers. And that again indicates that maybe these D1 and D2 features, they are related to some kinds of defects which you are filling up uh, as you are exciting more and more. Uh, one, one question I have here. So, you know, the, how light polarization is affecting these excitations and the excitations in this figure? Yeah, so basically if I go back to the introduction. Yeah, so if, so here is a typical uh, Brillouin zone of a monolayer uh, transition metal dichalcogenide crystal. Mm -hmm. So there are two alternate valleys, K and K prime, right? Right. And because of a combination of time reversal symmetry and broken inversion symmetry in these materials, you have some typical optical selection rules at these points of the Brillouin zone. I see. I see. And so what happens is that if, for example, if you want to excite a hole uh, from K valley into the conduction band of the K valley, mm -hmm. then you can, you need a momentum uh, which is minus half, or you can excite it with a right circularly polarized light, which imparts a momentum of plus one, uh, sorry, plus, yeah, minus one. And then you can excite a hole between the valence to the conduction band. Similarly, when you use a left circularly polarized light, you can impart a momentum of minus one. And so you can excite the other valley here. I see. Sorry, okay. it, it, I'm confusing between the two, but you get the point. Yeah, right? I understand. I, okay. okay. Yeah. So that is how you can specifically uh, excite one valley and keep the other unchanged. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so yeah, so, so this saturation of the P integrated PL intensity also points to the defect nature of uh, these two transitions. So we also looked at the uh, uh, integrated PL intensities of these features as a function of temperature and plotted them in a Arrhenius kind of plot, uh, fitting them using this equation over here. And when you do that, you find that uh, in the range between 100 Kelvin to 300 to room temperature, these three features follow a very similar behavior. And the activation energy that you get out of this Arrhenius plot is of the order of 50 milli electron volts. So uh, the important thing to notice is that these D1 and D2 also follow a behavior uh, which is similar to the A exitonic feature, which indicates that again, there is a commonality between D1 and D2 and the A exciton. So maybe these features D1 and D2 are coming from some kind of bound excitons, which are getting bound to some kind of defects. But what kind of defects? Is this defect a kind of impurity or add atom that is present on, on the MOS2 surface? Or is it a structural defect? So what kind of defect is not very clear from these experiments, although it is clear that these features are from defect bound excitons. So in order to investigate this aspect, what we did is we did some annealing experiments. So we annealed, uh, we took our samples, which typically show these D1, D2 and A features very prominently. And we first of all annealed them under vacuum. Uh, and then we annealed them under sulfur atmosphere. So when you anneal, these samples under vacuum, you expect that you would create these sulfur vacancies because uh, these are the most typical uh, defects in these materials which have the lowest formation energy. So you would expect that when you are annealing it, the easiest defect to form would be these sulfur vacancies. And so what you observe here is that uh, with respect to the A features, these D1 and D2 features become more prominent. 
while when you anneal the same sample or a, a similar set of samples under a sulfur atmosphere you see that these d1 and d2 features are getting suppressed and so this experiment kind of clearly uh, shows us that these features d1 and d2 are coming are not coming from some external defect like an impurity sitting on the mos2 surface or something like or some adsorbent but it is coming from the structural defects of single and double uh, sulfur vacancies so we assign these uh, d1 features to single sulfur vacancies and these d2 features to bi sulfur vacancies which are the second most uh, common defects in these materials and because d2 features are not seen uh, in some samples as i showed in the in the first part uh, we assign them to bi sulfur vacancies and d1 to single sulfur vacancies okay so so this uh, example shows you that you can use photoluminescence spectroscopy in combination with its polarization dependence in combination with temperature uh, dependence and do some additional experiment to actually understand the nature of these defects that exist in 2d materials okay so as a last part of uh, this talk now i will present uh, again some of my own work where we have done a joint raman and pl study of lithium doped monolayer mos2 so first of all why do we want to dope lithium into mos2 well because it is known theoretically and also in experiments that when you dope lithium on mos with, when you dope mos2 with lithium it donates electrons lithium is an electron donor and when you have sufficient Uh, electrons that are donated to MOS2, it can undergo a structural as well as an electronic phase transition uh, from a 2H form to a 1T or 1T prime form. So basically, when uh, you dope MOS2 with lithium, its structure changes. So the unit cell changes from trigonal prismatic to octahedral, and its electronic properties also change. It becomes from a semiconducting material to a metallic crystal and so this is why we are interested in this and also this 1t form of mos2 has interesting properties like nonlinear optical effects and sometimes even superconductivity so what we wanted to understand is uh, how we can use optical spectroscopy uh, to quantify lithium doping in mos2 okay so what so this is our typical optical setup and this is our sample which is cvd grown monolayer mos2 this scale bar is 50 micrometers and we place our samples in a ultra high vacuum atmosphere because uh, this 1t prime form is not stable at uh, under ambient conditions so you have to do these experiments under a controlled uh, conditions and we excite our sample using uh, a red laser and then we do polarization dissolved detection of the pl and raman spectrum and so this is a typical raman and pl spectrum of a monolayer mos2 uh, crystal that we probed and here you see that the pl is circularly polarized because of the valley polarization uh, that i have discussed before but the raman spectrum is also circularly polarized but this has nothing to do with the valley polarization it, it comes because of the different symmetries of these raman modes that are present over here so after characterizing the pristine samples we decided to dope these samples with lithium so we basically take thermally we take uh, it's called a getter Uh, uh, excuse me. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. So, how the uh, symmetry of the Raman modes uh, is uh, uh, the uh, uh, how the symmetry of the Raman modes decide what polarization could come here? Uh, yeah. So, if you basically write the Raman tensor for these modes, 
uh, and you also write the and you also basically write the matrices for circular polarization selections then you will see that for for example for the e1 2g mode and uh, for example for the e1 2g mode in a cross polarization geometry you will have zero in your uh, raman tensor and when you, you have the a1 g mode then in the same polarization geometry you will get zero so basically you can calculate it i will give you a reference but if you write the raman tensors of these modes you can simply see that by calculation okay fine okay okay so then we uh, yeah then we went on to basically dope our samples with lithium atoms so how we dope our samples is that uh, we have something called a getter which is filled with uh, some lithium based compound and when we heat this getter it sort of gives out a stream of lithium atoms which goes on to the mos2 surface and sits there uh, we expect them to be physical physically adsorbed but they but since this we could not get rid of the sulfur atoms uh, sorry the lithium atoms at the end of the experiment they might be forming some chemical bonds as well okay so when you look at the evolution of uh, these typical raman modes that we saw in the pristine mos2 as a function of lithium doping you see uh, that you see two things basically these the energies of these modes shift and also they become more and more broad and so what happens is that when you are so what we expect is happening is that when you are introducing lithium atoms on the mos2 surface you are creating some kind of structural disorder and this structural disorder breaks the raman selection rule of momentum conservation and so you start seeing the signatures of these raman modes away from the gamma point and they follow the dispersion that you expect for these a1g and e1g2g modes and so their dispersion goes in opposite direction and so you see them shifting in opposite direction here similarly the broadening can be understood because of creation of disorder in the material now another feature that appears uh, because of lithium doping is that you start seeing new raman new modes in your raman spectrum new phonon modes so in the pristine sample you see that this in this uh, range of energies a raman shift you don't see any modes but when you start doping with lithium atoms you see these modes appearing and becoming more and more prominent as a function of doping and so these modes can be identified with longitudinal acoustic modes at the k and m point of the bilua zone and these modes were previously seen actually in disordered mos2 where the disorder was created intentionally by bombarding them with argon atoms and so you can uh, quantify the amount of disorder uh, in your mos2 crystal by plotting the ratio of these modes versus the ratio of the e1 2g mode which is present in the pristine case and when you do that you find that uh, the disorder tends to increase as a function of lithium doping and why these uh, modes become raman active uh, in the disordered crystal is the reason is the same as uh, that as why you see those d and d prime peaks in the raman spectrum of graphene again there are these intervalley raman scattering processes which become active in the presence of defect so basically you can now scatter electrons from one valley to the other with the help of these k especially these k phonon modes which have the right momentum and then a defect can scatter them back and they can recombine and so you see you start seeing these uh, modes in your raman spectrum next what uh, we did is we also looked at the photoluminescent spectrum of uh, this uh, lithium doped mos2 with uh, more and more lithium doping and what you observe here first is that uh, the 
the intensity of the PL spectrum decreases dramatically, almost by two orders of magnitude, as you dope more and more lithium to it. And this results from a combination of two things. That is what we expect at least, that first of all, you are creating disorder in your sample, which is very clear from the modes that are appearing in the Raman spectrum. But at the same time, you are also perhaps initiating this semiconductor to metal transition because your lithium atoms are giving more and more electrons to the MOS2 lattice. And so it's a combination of these two things that suppresses the PL intensity. Also, what you see is that initially the PL spectrum redshifts and with more and more doping, it starts to blue shift. And the reason for this is that when you start doping the material with lithium, uh, you, you create more and more electron. And as we discussed before, you have more dominance of the trion peak, which is supposed to occur at a slightly lower energy than the, uh, than the exciton peak. And so you have a redshift in your spectrum, which is an indicator of doping. But when you create more and more disorder, you have these small domains in your sample. And so in these domains, when you excite them optically, quantum confinement effects become dominant and they cause the spectrum to blue shift. So that is why with at higher doping, you see a blue shift in the PL spectrum. Okay, finally, we also did polarization resolved uh, measurements on these samples as a function of lithium doping. And so now what you would expect is that because you are able to scatter your electrons from one valley to the other with the help of these defects, so that now these intervalley scattering processes become dominant, uh, you can scatter your electrons and holes from one valley to the other. And so you would lose the valley polarization that you create with your excitation laser in the PL spectrum, because these scattering processes are typically much faster than the time for in which the electrons and holes recombine. So you would scatter them to a different valley and they can also recombine from there. And another thing is that they can also be lost uh, because of the non-radiative processes that you uh, create because of creating disorder in your sample. And so what you expect is that the valley polarization should decrease uh, as you dope more and more lithium. And that is what we observe over here. So basically for the pristine sample, if you have typically 80% uh, valley polarization, but with increasing lithium doping, the valley polarization goes down. Now, in order to confirm that this effect is true and is not uh, just happening in, a, in localized positions because of laser heating or any other effect, uh, we took these 30 by 30 micrometer maps of valley polarization. And you can clearly see in these maps uh, that for pristine sample, the valley polarization is much higher than, uh, for example, 70 seconds of lithium doping in the experiment. Okay, so with this uh, final example, I would like to conclude my talk. So what I discussed with you today is that the optical properties of these two dimensional materials are very sensitive to any kinds of defects and disorder. Raman and PL spectroscopy are very effective tools to characterize defects in these materials in combination with uh, polarization dependence, temperature dependence, and annealing experiments, and so on. And finally, as a future outlook or something that is now being done in many parts of the world. Uh, is that by controlled introduction of defects, you can tune the electronic structure of these materials and hence change the optical properties uh, as you wish. Okay, with this, I would like to end my talk and thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, uh, thanks, Nehid. This was a wonderful talk. Uh, so we will now move on to uh question and answer session so if anybody has a question uh, you can uh, raise your hand or write in chat and uh, i'll ask you to unmute you and we can ask questions one by one yeah thank you
So can I ask a question, Nihit? Uh, yeah. uh, this is a low, this lithium experiment were done at low temperature or at room temperature? So the the do doping has been done at room temperature, but then I transfer my sample from one chamber of the one vacuum chamber to the other, then cool it down and do the PL measurements. Okay. okay. I have one more question. You know, yeah. can we control the intra valley, you know, the transition or scattering somehow experimentally? Intra valley absorption or intra valley scattering? Yeah. yeah. So, so, as I said, maybe you can uh, controllably introduce defects in your material. So, in ideal compound, let's say we do some simulation or calculation. So, in that case, we will not assume there is, there will be some intra valley. Is getting so different in these transitions. Or can Cal we include finitely some amount of? Well, in calculations, I I don't know how to include or not. Include. In general, in real materials where we deal, there will be always inter and intra valley transitions. Yes, in real materials there will be. And uh, you can, for example tune the band structure somehow mm -hmm. uh, and that would affect these processes. For example, you can apply a magnetic field and that might change the, you know, uh, the band gap that might shift the band gap with respect in the K and K prime valley. Mm -hmm. And that may, you know, affect these. So is there uh, any way to sections. recognize, let's say we have some semiconductors or insulators when the range of band gap increases in that case there is some you know some rough understanding that the intervalley scattering will be dominate or less or something like that mm. no i i don't know actually sorry okay sure okay. Uh, hi, Nihi. Hi, Vishwas. Uh, can you talk about the uh, stability of the 1T phase of uh, monolayer MOS2? Like... Yeah, so 1T phase, as I mentioned, is not stable at room temperature. If you uh, just have your uh, MOS2, pristine MOS2, but what you can do is you can encapsulate MOS2 in, uh, I think, in some papers, they have shown that they can uh, encapsulate this lithium doped MOS2 with lithium hydrox, lithium hydride or something. So when you have a lithium hydride layer on top of this lithium doped MOS2, then it can remain stable for some time and maybe even at room temperature. Maybe some people might have tried boron nitride, HBN encapsulation, but I am not aware of that work, but perhaps by encapsulation, you can uh, make it more stable. Okay. So I'm also curious about the getter that you said when you use lithium doping, what is a get? It's just a, it's just a piece of lithium or is it something else? I think it's a piece of lithium. Uh, I. So yeah, it's, I think it's a piece of lithium and you apply a large voltage uh, to uh, thermally, you know, evaporate it. And right. then it's pointed towards your sample. And then you have lithium atom, a beam of lithium atoms, which goes and sits on it and dopes it. That's very similar to thermal evaporation, right? Or is it different? Yeah, maybe it, yeah, it's similar to thermal evaporation. But it's uh, done in ultra high vacuum. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. And this is exfoliated MOS2. No, no, or... this is CVD grown. So this came from our collaborators. So you can see the image over here. And you, uh, so one one question, which is a random question, which is that I have never understood that why are these boards called A1G and E12G? What is the reason behind this nomenclature? Do you do you know? I think it comes from the group theory. Okay. But I, I'm not ex an expert in that, but these A, A modes typically are the out of plane vibrations and okay. E modes are typically in plane. Uh, 
yeah and the nomenclature is mostly coming from group theory but i i simply don't know much about this so it's never been the case that you have found a new mode and you have to give it a give it a name <laughs> no i always whatever i have seen so far it's already reported in the literature <laughs> okay but then if 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 somebody finds it then of course you have to understand group theory very well to actually give it a name and characterize it okay all right all right Okay, uh, so it seems uh, uh, those are the questions. So Nehi, thanks for this wonderful talk. Thank uh, you. So uh, I guess we'll end it now. Okay. Thank so, you very much. Thank you. We can give a virtual clap. Thank you very much, and it was very nice to meet all of you. today and discuss yeah same to same to me as well after some and yes. hopefully i wish all of you all the best for the future yeah. and yeah okay bye